Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6 is where I'm going to go today. I'm only going to read a few, a few passages. I would encourage you as your homework to take this home and read it, study it, and let God speak to you through it. I don't have enough time today to read uh, all the scripture that I, that I would like to read. Uh, I'm just going to just read a few texts to highlight the, the story today, and then we'll dive in. Joshua chapter 6, starting at verse 1, says this, Now the gates of Jericho uh, were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, and no one came in. For then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men, and do this for six days. Have, have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark, and on the seventh day... March around the city seven times with the, pre with the priests blowing the trumpets. For when you hear the sound of a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout, for then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go, will go up, everyone straight in. Verse 1, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, no one came in. Verse 2, then the Lord said to Joshua, see, see. I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the Bible. Lord, we thank you that when we read it, it is literally nourishment for our soul. And so, God, we thank you for the Bible, how it is living and breathing. It is the, it is the real word of God. It is, it is not outdated. It does not need reworked. It does not re, need rewrote. God, the Bible is a holy word of God that still speaks to us today. It does not need any help from me. For it can preach all by itself. And so, Father, we simply illuminate your word today. Divide it uh, as you see fit and place it into the lives of people where they're living. And God, may it be impossible today to leave this place the same way we came. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask it. And everybody says amen and amen. If you're taking notes, I've tagged the title today. Circle it. Circle it. I, I don't know if, if, it's, if it's actually accurate to, to define the mountain in our life as insurmountable. I, I believe it's how we look at the mountain in our life that makes the difference. It's how we look at the thing in front of us uh, that, that makes the difference. I believe, it's, I believe it's your perspective to what lies in front of you that, that holds the power. I believe that this, what I've learned and what I'm still learning as a pastor and even more importantly as a Christian, is that my perspective has the potential to destroy my purpose. My perspective to the thing that's in front of me has the potential to destroy the purpose in which it was in front of me for. I believe it's how you look at your mountain that's significant. It's how you look at the Jericho in your life that's significant. It's how you look at the issue in your life today that, that's significant. Because let's face it, you either have the power... To, to, to focus on, on, on the good or to focus on the bad. Like, what you, ha you have, you control the power as to what you focus on. You can either focus on what is right in your life or you can focus on what is wrong with your life. You, you can focus on what is right with your family or you can choose to focus on what is wrong with your family. You can choose to focus on what is right with your marriage or you can choose to focus on what is wrong with your marriage. You get the power to choose what you focus on. And I don't know about you, but I choose to refuse to, to keep walking around and dealing with the same thing that God has already given me the plan and the route to get out of. Like, I choose to focus on what is wrong with, with the world. I'm, I'm choosing to focus on what is right with the world. Like, I'm not choosing to focus on what is wrong in our city. I'm looking and choosing to focus on what is actually going right in our city. I'm not looking at what is going wrong in the church. I'm actually focusing on what is going right in the church. Like, I get a power to choose what I focus on. Here's what I know. What you, what you focus on gets bigger in your life. So if you continually focus on the negative, guess what grows in your life? The negative. If you focus on, on what your husband's not doing, guess what's evident in your life? The things he's not doing. It's what you focus on that grows. If you learn to focus on the good things, you learn to find the best things in life. If you focus on the positive things in life, and I'm not going Joel Osteen, but I am believing that you, can, you have the power to choose what you focus on, and what you focus on, I believe, de determines your future. Some of you, I believe, are simply looking at the right thing the wrong way. You're looking at the thing that is in front of you, the right thing, but you're looking at the right thing the wrong way. 
Some of you are, some of you are looking at, at what is wrong instead of looking at what may be right. Like it's not, it's not about how big the walls are. It's not about how big this thing is. It's like what is God going to do and how is God going to use this thing that seems too big in my life? If you've, if you've ever doubted, like if you ever had any doubts in your mind about this thing in your life, if you ever had this doubt in your mind about, man, am I able to get through this? Am I able to, to make it through? Am I the one that's able to overcome the situation? Uh, if you've ever been doubted or, or have, have people doubt you, like you're in good company. I did some research. Walt Disney was told he, he did not have an imagination. That's what he was told. Uh, Michael Jordan was cut from the basketball team. Said he couldn't jump. The Beatles were told their music was not attractive to people. Their first album was, was, was not attractive to people. Thomas Edison was told that he was stupid by his teachers. So I think if you've ever been doubted or you have some type of doubt, you're in good company. Like, I, I love to be counted out. Like, I thrive on adversity. Like, I, I feast on when somebody says my best days are, are, are behind me. Like, I thrive on that. I love when, 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 when people chirp. Like, I love when I hear my name in our city. Like, I love when I know I got haters talking about me. Like, I love it when lies are started about me. You know why? Because they must see something that I haven't seen yet that are trying to block me and discourage me from getting there. I'm just saying, when you got stuff in your life, come on, that's a, that's a, that should be an encouragement to you. Like, hey, man, if they're talking about it, they must know something I don't yet. I thrive on adversity. I wake up, I wake up every day saying, I can't wait to see what God's going to do in my life. I wake, up with, I, I wake up saying, man, how is God going to move this weekend? How, who, who's God going to save today? When I pull up on the parking lot this weekend, hey, what family is going to be wrecked by God today? What person is going to get set free today? See, you may not know, but we've been praying for you to get here. I've been praying to God all week that he'd give me something that you need. You may just be, be showing up, but guess what? You're showing up, but you're showing up on the back of a prayer, and there's prayer here, and they've been praying and believing, and so today might just be your day. And I wake up every day saying, man, this is going to be an amazing weekend. Somebody's going to get saved today. Somebody's going to walk in on their highway to hell, but have an encounter with God that's going to radically set them free. Like, I, just, this ain't, I mean, I, just, I wake up encouraging the Lord. And so it could be today that you need to change your perspective or your mindset or your focus. Could it be you're looking at the right thing through the wrong lens or the wrong way? And many of us, we have this idea of what it's going to look like for God to break us out. And what, we have this idea of what God's going to do to break us free. And we have this idea of what it's going to be for God to, to really move in our situation. And we have this idea uh, of how God's going to do it. We have this concept about, man, how God's going to speak to us. We have this concept of what it means to live for Jesus. We love the idea of being blessed, but we don't like to, we don't like to give any offering. We love the concept of, of reaping and sowing, but we like the reaping, but don't, don't like the sowing. The concept sounds sexy, but the commitment level, too much. We love the concept of living all out for God and receiving God's blessing, but we don't really back it up with the lifestyle that we live to be in, in the posture of the right position to receive the blessing of God. We like the concept, but many of us struggle with the commitment. We like the concept of living for Jesus, but do we have the commitment it takes to see it through? Many people like the concept of feeling God's presence in the room, but the only reason we see God's presence in the room is because people lift up holy hands to God. Like the only way God's spirit inhabits this room is by the praises of his people. And so if you're not a worshiper, you should find somebody that is and thank them for lifting their hands and praising God because they did it. Now we all get to feel the tangible presence of, of God enter the room. Are you with me? Like he doesn't show up because we have a band and we have a screen and we have lights. He's not really impressed. He doesn't really, he's not attracted to that. He's not a mosquito. He's not attracted to light. Our God is holy and he's attracted to worship. And I don't know about you, but I'm a competitor and I don't want any other church in our city giving God more praise and worship because if the Holy Spirit only has a little bit to give, I want to be a church that has a worshiping church so much that he can't walk by or, or drive by without getting into the presence of, his, of this room. But many of us, we love the concept of living for Jesus, but do we, do we have the commitment level it takes to, to walk it through? We love the concept of getting free, but do you have the commitment to do what it takes to live and stay free? We love the concept. The concept of Christianity is awesome and amazing, but the reality is it's not always awesome and amazing. The concept is we've been lied to saying it's always, it's always apple pie and ice cream. No, it's not always apple pie and ice cream. 
Sometimes there's sauerkraut seasons where you've got to hold your nose and swallow because it tastes bad. But you also know that, man, if I can just get through the season, I'm going to be better because of it. So a lot of us, we love the, we love the concept. We, we, we love serving God when things are good, but we don't like the commitment level to stay serving him when things are not good. And so we're here today looking for change and comfort at the same time. But you can't have change and comfort at the same time. The only way you change is when you're discomfort. If you're always wanting to be comfortable in church, if you're always wanting them to have comfortable moments, then you, you're really not after change. You're not, you're not after God to change. You're, you're, a, you're, you're after God to give you a prescription for the, for the pain that you're living in. Because in order to be truly set free, see, you can be different than you are today. Like, let's just dive in a little bit today. Do you really think it's God's plan for your life to deal with what you're still dealing with today? And if we're honest, many of us have had an encounter with God. We've came to the altar and we've cried and we prayed and we heard God speak. And then we get up, we go back and we don't do what God told us to do to, for, in order for us to get free. Like, do you really think it's God's will for your life to still be addicted to fill in the blank? Like, Really? You, you think it's God, God, God's will for your life for you to still be struggling with depression? You think, it's, you think it's God's plan for your life for you to still be battling those thoughts and those minds and that way of living? You really think that's God's plan for your life? Let me just help you. It's not God's plan for your life. But an order to change does not come when you're comfortable. Change comes when you're willing to be uncomfortable, to, to be willing to say no to the things that you want to say yes to and be willing to say yes to the things that your flesh wants to say no to. Like, it's comfort that got you in that bad marriage. It's comfort that got you into that addiction. It's comfort that got you into that way of thinking. It's comfort that got you into that bad relationship. It's comfort that got you into that friend group. It, it's comfort that got you stuck there. It's comfort that has you thinking those thoughts. It, it, it's comfort. And the, only, and the only way out, the only way to truly change is to be willing to be fully committed to God. Deuteronomy chapter 2 says this, he's, uh, God talking to Moses, he says, hey Moses, how long are you going to walk around the same mountain? Matter of fact, it says, you've circled this mountain long enough, turn and go north. I feel like God's asking you today, hey, how long are you going to circle this thing? How long are you going to circle this thing? Like, don't you think it's time for you to advance and go north? Isn't it time for you to stop looking at this and start looking at this? How long are you going to keep walking around the same mountain? How long are you going to walk around the same addiction? How long are you going to walk around that same relationship? How long, how long are you going to walk around that same friendship? How long are you going to walk around that same thing? It's time for you to break, camp, and advance. It's time to look north. It's time to look up. It's time to focus your eyes on God. It's time to stop looking at your surroundings and start looking at Jesus. Because, man, yeah, it, it's, it's this, this, this Jericho. It can be a mediocre marriage. Jericho can be a habit you, you can't seem to break. It can, be a, it, can, it can be a relationship that keeps taking you back in the wrong direction. It can represent a mindset that controls you. It can be an attitude that causes you to isolate from society and not go all in because of a past hurt or some past thing. That, that Every time you start to plug in, like you're reminded of, man, that if I do it again, I'm going to get hurt the same way. It's not always going to be that way. Jericho can represent hard, hard times or maybe hatred towards an ex or unforgiveness that you want to hold on to. It's guilt from your past mistakes, but whatever it is, like you can fill in the blank in your life with what is this thing called Jericho in my life? Because here's what I know. We'll go through seasons in our faith walk where some, sometimes we'll walk through seasons where we hear God and sense God and feel God and know he's there and you know, it's like every day, like you can literally feel his presence, right, Tony? Like, you can feel it. Like, you know he's there. And, but then there are other times in our life, when my life, maybe you can relate today, where I'm walking through faith and I haven't heard God speak to me. Like, I'm worshiping God, but I feel nothing. I'm praying to God and I hear nothing. I think it's important to understand, even though we can't see him, feel him, or hear him, it's important to know that he is still right there beside of you. 
God has not left you. God has not abandoned you. God has not forgot about you. He is not off doing something else and leaving you. But no, God is still with us even if we don't feel him, see him, or sense him. And faith is not always easy. And if you want to study the Bible and it won't take you long to figure it out. I'm going through the Bible now from, from, from beginning to end. And what I'm, what I'm seeing day in and day out, like the Bible is full of stories of peoples and tribes and kings and armies that are constantly engaged in battles, like wars. Like they, they fought so many battles. And I, when I dive in a little deeper and see it, like it's because they were so aggressive in taking territory. And a kingdom, the kingdom of God... We are supposed to expand by taking territory. So as God's great church and as Christian men and women, there will be times that we all have to go to war and have to battle. Like we just came out of a war. We just came out of a battle as God's great church. Like we, we were in a fight and we were in a battle to stay open, whether you know it or not. Like we came out of lockdown. We came out of government control. We came out of this idea, man, is the church ever going to be alive again? Will we ever see a packed football stadium again? Will we ever see a full room again? Will our church even be existent? Will there ever be this thing called the local church community again? And whether you know it or not, we were at war and we were fighting. And look around. I think the answer is pretty obvious. God's church is still alive. And God's church is still growing. And God's church is still thriving. And come on, we took hell's best shot. But... We're still standing, and we took hell's best hook, and yet we still, we still got a couple punches up our sleeve, and I'm just telling you, God's church is still growing and thriving. And so I think, it's, I think sometimes it's, we get this idea that Christian people are supposed to be silent. We're not always supposed to be silent. Sometimes we can be silent. There are some things that you'll see me not talk about I'm silent on, not because I'm afraid to tackle it, but I don't need to waste my breath talking about it. I'll pick and choose what I I talk about. I'll pick and choose what I pull from this pulpit. I'll I'll pick and choose what I preach on. But what I will tell you is when I I, I decide to go to war and I start to fight a battle, it's not because I got a bone to pick, but I got the Bible to pick. And I got got to stand up and I got to defend it. And I got to speak truth whether it offends people. And so I think it's important that you know that the Bible over and over and over, there were wars and battles and some battles were, were like an all out war and some battles were large battles and some battles were small battles and sometimes they would sneak attack and sometimes they would just pray the Lord, the Lord would fight the battle. Like all over the Bible, it's full of, of wars and battles. And I think it's important that we understand that our, our fight is just getting started. Not only necessarily as the church, but I believe the next fight we're seeing that we need to fight is for families. Moms and dads, don't you dare stop fighting. Just because the election is quote-unquote almost over after seven days of counting doesn't mean we stop fighting. It means we probably got to fight now more than ever. Like, you, be- you, better, you better fight to make sure you, you know what your kid's reading. Like, you, be- you better not let your, li- your kid go to the library alone and pull off one off the shelf. Like, that's the kind of world we're living in. And yeah, I'll go there for a minute because I got a bone to pick with that. I don't need my kid to be indoctrinated by some book that's on a shelf. I, I-, I want to control what my kids read. I want to control what my kids know. I want to control what my kids watch. And I'm going to fight because it matters. And if you don't got the faith to fight it, I'll fight it for you. If you're afraid to get canceled, I'm not afraid. I'm going to fight it for you. Why? Because you- your kids matter. And I refuse to stay silent. I refuse to stay on the back line. I, I believe that we got to fight for what our kids watch. And we got to fight for how our kids are educated. And we have some amazing educators in our church today that are in the public school system that I praise God for. And I thank them, thank God for them. And they are a blessing, but they are outnumbered in our city. And we have some jacked up people in our classrooms trying to teach our kids stuff that ain't even in the book. And I'm just telling you, you better make sure you know what your kids are being educated on. And this is not to tout our academy, but I'm telling you, the time's going to come where you better make sure that your kids are getting rooted in God's word. And, and you better make sure your kids are knowing who they are and what their identity is. And that God didn't make a mistake. And they don't need a sex change. They don't need a transgender change. But they are made in God's image. And God did not make a mistake. And I feel the spirit of God right now on my life. And you've got to make sure that you stand and say, this may be what the world says, but this is not what my God says. And there's going to come a time when we've got to learn to fight. For our kids, you better, you better fight, Dad, to know who's DMing your daughter. Because I know what jokers in this church are DMing my daughter. And I'm coming for you. Because I'm fighting for her. 
And you should fight for yours. Because not all boys have good intentions. And really, let's say this, not all girls have good intentions. But we better fight to, to know what our kids are reading. And you better have one-on-ones with your kids as teachers and make sure they ain't, they, they ain't crazy or woke. Or... You, you, better, you, better, you, better, you better fight to know who they hang with. And we got to fight to know what they believe. Don't, don't, don't leave it up to me to teach your kids what they should believe in. You better pastor your kids and teach your kids what they believe in. And so today, there, there, are, there are battles all over, and there's, there's battles for our families, there's battles for our future, there's battles for our marriage, we're standing and fighting battles for our kids. And, and I just think there, there, are, there are seasons where, where we will be in an all-out, all-out, all-out fight and war. But here's what, I, here's what I got wrote down. But the promise we have when we fight is we don't fight for victory. We fight from it. So when I'm battling something, I'm, I'm, already, I'm fighting from the position that I've already knocked you out. And when I'm fighting knowing that I already win, it changes how I approach the fight. And as Christian people, when you, when you fight the right battle the right way, you're not fighting to win. You're fighting because you already won. And so here, here, here's where we are, like Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, I sang that song growing up, like Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, 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 like this is an old Bible story, what has it got to do with me? It has a lot to do with us. Joshua, Joshua was a mighty warrior, I find it interesting that, that Joshua uh, was, was around when Moses was the leader and Moses tried to take his, the, the people into the promised land and Joshua was one of the initial 12 spies that Moses sent out to spy the land and jo- Joshua and Caleb came back and said, hey man, the land's good, it's got grapes the size of VW bugs, it's going to be awesome, we need to get there and it's got milk and it's got honey, it's, go- it's awesome, we got to go inhabit it, but how many people know the 10 spies who none of us know the names of because nobody loves negativity? But the ten spies said, nah, that's, there's giants in the land, they're, 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 they're mean, and they're, they're, we're, we're going to surely be done. We're going we're, we're to get killed. And so Moses, what's he do? He takes, his, he takes his people, and they say, stuck in the wilderness, wandering around for 40 years on what should have been less than a two-week journey to the promised land. And so Joshua is taken over leadership. Moses is gone, and Joshua steps in, and Joshua now, his first battle is, is to take the land that he already knew was supposed to be his. Joshua takes his troops, and he heads up, and I find it interesting in the Bible, the first thing that God said to Joshua was this. He goes, see, I have given you Jericho. So in other words, Joshua is looking at a, at a, at a Jericho that is shut up, that is barred, that is being surrounded, that walls that are seven feet tall, 12 feet thick, and, G- and God says, Joshua, I've given you Jericho. See, I have given you Jericho. What oftentimes happens in in our world is whatever word from heaven never matches our reality on earth. God said, Joshua, see, I've given you Jericho. Well, Joshua's like, nah, you ain't giving me Jericho. Like, I don't know what you're seeing, but what I'm seeing, you ain't giving me Jericho. It's st- the, the, the gates are still shut. There's still people on guard and the walls are still tall and the walls are still thick and there ain't no way you've given me nothing. God said, see, I have given you Jericho. The first thing you need in your life is to get a word from God. You've got to see what God said. If you're taking notes, see what God says. Get a word. The most important thing you need in your life is to get a word from God. Let me be extremely clear clear today. You need a word from God for your life. You need a word of God for your, from God for your family. You need a word of God. I believe, I believe everybody should try to rally around and pray, and God, give me a word personally for this upcoming year. Like, you need to receive a word. Like, Joshua needed a word. See, I've given you Jericho. Like, you don't need a word from social media. You don't need a word from your best friend. You don't need a word from your crazy cousin. Like, no, you don't, you don't need a word from, your, from the horoscope and the newspaper. Like, you don't need a word. You don't need to go to some psych and get a word. No, you need to get a word from God. And you don't get a word walking down the street saying, give me a word. You get in his word and he'll give you a word. Like, you've got to get in the word. If you get in the word, the word will get in you. You've got to get a word. And so far too often, we run to every other source to get a word. 
Like we'll go to every shrink in town looking to get the right word for our life and the wrong word thinking the right thing is not the right thought. Like you've got to get a right word and the right word comes from God. Here's what I got wrote down. Never go to battle or war without a word. If you're going to fight something, make sure you have a word to back it up. When I come, this is a war for me, by the way. I'm, I'm in war today. This is, I, and I came to war with a word. Like every Sunday I preach, I'm at war. I'm in a battle. You don't know it, but I'm in a battle, and i got to come to the battle with a word. How many people know if I come to, the, to, the, to a battle without the word of God, I'm not fighting it the right way? Like i got to go to war with a, with a word. I can't go preach a word without the word. God said, see, I have given you Jericho. Could it be that he's trying to say, see, I have given you joy? See, I have given you breakthrough. See, I have given you freedom. See, I have, I have given you healing. See, I have given you that. See, I have made this way. Could, could, could it be that he's talking in your life? Look, look, see, I have given you fill in the blank. Because seeing always starts with a word. Come on, if you've ever been saved any length of time, you know exactly what I'm preaching to be true. If God said it, that settles it. There's a t-shirt. If God said it, that settles it. God said it, I believe it. If God said it, I'm standing on it. If God said it, I'm holding tight onto it. If God said it, I'm taking it to the bank. If God said it, I'm going to war with it. If God said it, come on, if God said it, that's all I need. I know that if God said it, he's going, it's, going to come, it's going to come to pass. The Bible says, see, I have given you Jericho. The second thing he tells Joshua is, not only see it, but circle it. I think it's interesting to, to dive in a little bit deeper today. When you, when you see circle it, that's, you know, circle it, walk around, walk around Jericho once a day for six days, and on the seventh day, walk around it seven times. I think it's interesting that in you and I, we think, like, man, that's the dumbest thing that God could ever tell Joshua. Circle it? How crazy and dumb is that? It actually makes total sense because these are the same people that are used to circling in their life. When they were with Moses and Moses was their leader, all they did was circle. They circled the wilderness for 40 years and they circled the same mountain all over and over and over. And so when God gave the order to circle it, it made total sense to them. And personally, I think they're more excited because they only got to circle for seven days and not 40 more years. And God said, I want, I want you to circle it. And when you, when you begin to when you begin to circle it, here's what I know about when you, when you walk around or you circle it, no matter where I am on the circumference of the circle, I can see my Jericho. Yep. Yep. No matter how, where I go, what day it is, how good of a day or how bad of a day or how much faith or how much fear, no matter where I walk, I am always in, 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 in eyesight of what I'm circling. In other words, I'm not necessarily reminding myself, but I'm reminding of it that I know what it is and I am having enough faith to circle it. In other words, if I was scared, I would stop circling. But I, I think sometimes, like, we just got to learn by faith to keep circling. And so God told Joshua to have this people circle it. Now, when you circle it, all of a sudden, your faith begins to grow. And when you have faith and you know God is a God that you've seen God do things, like, here's what I know. When you know it's already done, I walk different. When I, when I know the bill's already paid, if I go to dinner with my mom and dad, I order different. Because I know he's picking up the bill and I'm going to get what I want because he's paying. Now, if I'm going to dinner without my parents, I'm not getting what I want. I'm getting what I just going to be suffice me for the day. Because when you know like the bill's already been paid, it changes how you order. And when you know that your daddy is powerful and owns a cattle on a thousand hills, it's different than what I do when I know I can't outgive my God. It changes how much seed I put in the soil. When I know the spirit of God falls fresh and lift up holy hands, it changes how I worship. Because when you know, it changes how you view it. And some of us, we're looking at the walls of Jericho in our life and you're looking at it the wrong way. You're looking at it as a mountain. You're looking at it as a problem. It's simply a door that's going to open up. For you to step into the place God's already promised you. Circle the promise. Don't circle the mountain. A lot of us, we love to circle the problem. We like to talk about the problem. We like to share our problems. And we love to post about our problems. And we love to post about what's going on. But 
But God said, I want you to circle the problem. I want you to circle the promise. I don't want you to circle what you see. I want you to circle how I see it. Because we are a generation that loves to highlight problems. We're a culture that, that, that reaps millions and millions of dollars on negativity. And you and I pay for it. That's why the news is always negative. Because we are attracted to negative. We want more negative. Because we're attracted. That's, that's our culture. We love to highlight problems. We love to post about our problems. We love to talk about our struggles because we love the sympathy that we get when we say we're struggling. But could it be that God's got that thing in your life not so that you'd ask for sympathy? But could it be that this is in your life so that he could show you through this struggle or through this mountain or through this Jericho that he's still able to make a way? Could it be that it's not meant for you to get on social media and talk about how bad your life is, but how about it's a chance for you to tell how faithful our God is? Quit circling the situation. Quit circling that, quit, quit circling that mountain and start circling the promise. Like how long are you going to circle the same mountain in fear? But I say if you're going to circle it, circle it in faith. Like circle that mountain for your family. Circle those walls for your future. Cir cir circle that thing for, for, for your kids. Circle it for your mind. Circle it. But when you circle it, you're not circling out of fear. You're circling out of faith. See, here's what I think and here's how I believe that. Now the Bible says that, that God said, Joshua, see it, circle it, and be silent about it. So in other words, the Bible says, see it, circle it, but don't say nothing. And a lot of us like to fight battles, but we like to talk about it while we're doing it. Not this one. God said, just shut up and walk. I don't need you to say a word. And in my life, here's what I know sometimes, like I'm circling this thing currently in our, in our, in our situation, in our life, in our church, and I'm trying to figure it out, and I'm trying to manipulate and push and try to create ways, and, and I'm, I'm getting frustrated because seem, nothing ever seems to fall in place. And the Lord spoke to me this week and said, when are you going to stop working and stop, start resting and let me go to work? In other words, you see it, I've already showed you, you've already circled it, but you haven't stopped working because you think you can make it happen. No, he told me I cannot make it happen, but the moment I take my hands off of it and give it to him, he'll start working it. And so I feel like they were walking around these walls, and worship team, you can get ready to come. And I think they were, as they were walking around these walls, I'm not saying they were saying it, but this is my message, I'm going to take liberty to preach it. I feel like they were starting to sing like, like they were seeing a victory. Like, I feel like, like, turn it around for my good. I feel like they were, that they were, they weren't saying it vocally, but they, and that they were feeling like, man, this is lap number one on day one, and we're going to see a victory, and God, God's going to do it. And they walked the first lap, and they, they went to Joshua and said, Joshua, what do we do? And he said, go home and rest. Let the, word go to, let, let, let the Lord go to work. And. Day two happens and they're singing, they're, they're lapping it again and they're circling and they've already saw the provision. Jo Joshua already saw it and so they take two laps and I feel like they're, they're, they're getting that, turn it around for my good. I, I, feel like, I feel like it's in there. And that went on for day after day after day and, and that seventh day something happened. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how it happened. I would love to have been there that day, but all I know is this. See, we are a culture that loves to shout, but not step. We think the shout brings the walls down. Like shouting is awesome. Shouting is sexy. Shouting gets us excited. But shouting does not bring the walls down in your life. Read it. On the seventh day, they walked around seven times. And on the seventh time, after the seventh lap, and then after the horns uh, uh, blew, they, the, the walls came tumbling down, and then they shouted. It wasn't that the shout brought the walls down. It was the faithfulness of the step that brought the walls down. Some of you have wandered around the same mountain long enough. You've already saw the provision. God's already spoke to you. You've circled it, but you haven't shouted about it. You haven't, you haven't gave praise for it. I just believe. I'm just one of these crazy faith preachers that believe God still speaks and God still does miracles. And God is still. And could it be today that your healing is one shout away? Could it be your breakthrough is one praise away? Could it be that your answer is one praise away? Come on, we got to learn to circle it today.